medcram.com. Okay, welcome to another MedCram lecture. Now, I've got a lot of requests out there to talk about a very difficult topic. We're going to talk about hyponatremia, okay? Low sodium. Now, this is a very complicated topic because we have to talk about water balance. We've got to talk about the difference between osmolality and tonicity and antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone and uh, compartments of fluids and the different types of hyponatremia. Are they isotonic? Are they hypotonic, hypertonic? And then of the hypotonic hyponatremias, is it hypovolemic, hypervolemic, and isovolemic? And it just goes on and on and on. But I think after you get done with my series here, in fact, I know after you get done with my series, you'll be able to work through how to deal with the different types of hyponatremia. So to do that, we have to build a little bit of a foundation so you can understand what we're talking about. So bear with me and go through these lectures and you'll see that it'll build on one another just like our other series on acid base. Okay, so the definition of hyponatremia is a sodium concentration of less than 135 milligrams per deciliter, okay? That is basically the definition. Anytime you have any word that says emia at the end, it's relating to the concentration of sodium, in this case sodium or any other molecule, in the blood. So hypokalemia, alkalemia, acidemia, all of that is related to the blood. So let's go ahead and build the foundation. The first thing that you should know is what is the definition of osmolality. So osmolality, O-S-M-O-L-A-L-I-T-Y. So that serum osmolality has an equation, and it's 2 times the sodium concentration plus the glucose concentration divided by 18, and that glucose concentration is in milligrams per deciliter, plus the BUN, and please look at our acute renal failure lectures to get an update on, on the BUN, and that's again in milligrams per deciliter, divided by 2.8. And the normal for that is 285 millimoles per kilogram. Uh, you can also say uh, milligrams per deciliter as well. So that is the definition of serum osmolality. Two times the sodium plus glucose divided by 18 plus BUN divided by 2.8. And that'll tell us if something has a basically a low osmolality, a normal osmolality, or a high osmolality. Now, something that's very similar to that is tonicity. It's a very similar concept, and you'll see it looks very similar. It's two times the sodium concentration plus the glucose divided by 18 once again. So why is it missing the BUN component? It's missing the BUN component because BUN can go freely between the plasma membranes. And so therefore, if BUN can go between plasma membranes, it really doesn't have too much of, a, of an effect on the difference between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. So from now on, what you'll see is we'll use tonicity and osmolality interchangeably. But just be aware that if they ask you to calculate the osmolality of something, this is the equation that you should use. Okay, we'll come back to that uh, again and again. The other thing you should know about is two major types of hormones. One of them is ADH. This is antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone is secreted from the posterior pituitary. It's actually made in the hypothalamus, but it's secreted from the posterior pituitary. And if you can remember where this works, it works at the collecting tubule of the nephron. And the presence of ADH at the collecting tubule of the nephron causes water reabsorption. And what's that going to do? What's re water reabsorption going to do? It's going to cause water not to go out into the urine but to be reabsorbed into the blood and basically it's going to have the effect of diluting uh, out a lot of your substances but specifically it's going to be used to retain water. The, this is a protein hormone and so it works almost instantaneously as soon as it's secreted. The other hormone is aldosterone. 
you'll if you look at our adrenal gland lecture you'll see that aldosterone is a steroid hormone it is secreted from the zona glomerulosa and it works primarily at the so we'll put down here adrenal cortex and it works primarily at the distal convoluted tubule of the nephron and its action is to cause reabsorption of sodium and because of that water and it causes excretion of potassium and excretion of protons so just be aware of those things we're going to talk about that obviously because water and sodium are going to be intimately related to the discussion that we're going to have today okay so any discussion regarding intracellular extracellular fluid you've got to know about the different compartments of the human body so let's get into a discussion of that and this drawing is going to be pretty important so I want to make sure that you understand uh, the different nuances uh, regarding this so this is a diagram essentially showing you the different compartments of fluid in the human body okay so this is the intracellular fluid so this represents this compartment here represents all of the all of the volume inside of cells this is the intravascular volume this represents all of the fluid inside arteries veins capillaries etc and this is the interstitial volume so this is separated this intravascular volume is separated by the interstitial volume by the capillary wall and we know the capillary wall is not a barrier to the movement of electrolytes and fluid and I'll represent that here by simply drawing little openings in that so basically sodium and water can go back and forth between these two and so basically this is effectively one chamber for or one component or one container for electrolytes fluid things of that in other words this wall does not separate their movement on the other hand this wall here that separates if you will the extracellular fluid from the intracellular fluid is separated and there is a a pretty tight barrier this is basically the the uh, membrane of the cell now now remember animals don't have cell walls like plants do but yet this is a pretty rigid wall when it comes to electrolytes water is able to move through it very freely of course because it's a not ionic compound but in terms of sodium sodium cannot go through this it is not permeable to sodium if sodium is going to go through it's got to go through channels and so this is very well regulated sodium is not going to be able to go through however water can go through all of this okay so water can go through here and water can go through here and so because of that uh, because sodium is able to freely go through here and water is able to we'll call this simply this whole thing the extracellular fluid compartment so this is intracellular fluid extracellular fluid and generally if you want to look at uh, compartments this is about four liters this is about 10 liters and this is about 28 liters of fluid so the key here is that there are three compartments the intravascular and the interstitial combine to form the extracellular fluid this is where sodium and water mix water is able to go across the semipermeable membrane but sodium is not and, and that's a that's a key there so when we're talking about drawing blood with needles okay this is the fluid compartment that we're talking about when we're talking about hanging IV fluids okay it goes into the vascular and extracellular fluid compartment so the question is going to be is what happens to these fluid compartments when there are perturbations in sodium and fluid management and, and we're going to talk about that so the way we're going to represent this from now on in the lecture uh, to simplify it is basically two compartments and remember this is going to be the intracellular fluid and this is going to be the extracellular fluid now why do I have it drawn this way as a vertical and as a horizontal well the way I'm going to represent this 
if you can imagine these are x and y axis, is the x axis is going to represent volume. So how much? So simply this dimension here represents how much volume is in there. And the y axis is going to demonstrate the sodium concentration. So the higher this is on the y axis, the higher the concentration of sodium or the lower the concentration of sodium. And the farther out this goes on the x axis, the more volume there is or consequently the less volume this is. Now because of that you'll note that the area then is simply represents the number of sodium molecules. Let me give you an example. If I were to add water to this, just straight out water, what would that do? The water would add volume to this compartment, but at the same time it would cause the sodium concentration to go down. So instead of it instead of it being these dimensions, we would have something more along the line of this dimension. But you could see that the area in the box would be the same because the number of sodium molecules wouldn't change, but the way this is depicted on the graph would change because we have a lower sodium concentration and a bigger volume. So that's how we're going to depict this. Just to finish up the analogy, if I did, by the way, add H2O to this, you would see what would happen here. The first thing that you would see would happen is that the sodium concentration would go down and that the volume would get bigger. That would be if there was absolutely no transport of water across this membrane. But we know that that's not the case because as soon as this sodium concentration would go down, remember this is a permeable membrane to water. And if water is on both sides of this and the sodium concentration goes down on this side, water is going to go to the side of the higher concentration. That's the law of osmosis. So you would have water going across from the extracellular fluid into the intracellular fluid. And you would see that would happen until what would happen? Until this would be diluted down to a similar level. Well, in fact, what would happen is, is that this would go down and then this would go down to meet this until this was equal. But because this has a much larger volume in fact, it's probably twice the volume of this, that about twice the volume of water that we're putting in here would go into the intracellular fluid chamber. And so you can see here that when you give pure water, or in medically speaking, uh, dextrose, D5W, when you give water to somebody, you can see why this does not expand the intra the intravascular volume. It's because the majority of this volume, as soon as it goes into the extracellular fluid, is going to go across the membrane and basically fill up the intracellular volume rather than the extracellular. There will be some left in the, in the extracellular volume, but because this is a larger volume, more of this is going to go into the intracellular volume. So to review, free water goes in, it causes a reduction in the sodium concentration. Because of that, the law of osmosis means that water will keep going across this membrane until the sodium concentration in the cell matches that in the extracellular fluid, which means that most of the water that you give the patient, if it's in the form of free water, is going to go into the intracellular fluid compartment. Now, that's as opposed to giving someone normal saline, or as we like to say, 0.9%, okay, or 0.9% normal saline. So normal saline, when is given, it's basically as if you're just adding it on to the edge. And why is that? Because the fluid concentration that is being added to the extracellular volume is already at exactly the same concentration, or very close to the same concentration of the fluid that's already there. Because of that, that will simply be added on to the volume. There is no change in the extracellular fluid concentration of sodium. Because of that, there is no shift of fluid over into the intracellular fluid. And that is why normal saline is the best type of fluid to give if your primary purpose is to expand the extracellular fluid compartment.
And that's how that is represented here. We see that the volume has gone up, but the sodium concentration in that extracellular fluid is the same. Okay, so with these basics, we're going to move on and talk about the different types of hyponatremia, the hypotonic hyponatremia, the hypertonic hyponatremia, and the hypotonic hyponatremia. So isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic. We'll talk about those in the next lecture. Thanks for joining us.